I'm joined today by Claire Wright. Uh, she's a founding partner of Wright and Wright, a practice she started with her husband Sandy. And Claire's just completed a very fine building uh, designed to house the uh, Lambeth Palace Library. Uh, but before we talk about that, perhaps Claire, I could ask you, I mean, how are you finding life at the moment during lockdown? I must say I do miss people and I'm beginning to miss being in the office and and being in touch with people and the interaction of the creative process. Right now, I, I mentioned the uh, Lambeth Palace Library. Now, just just uh, say to people that I, I have in my hand this rather splendid book, uh, <laughs> uh, which is called Special Collections, Right and Right, which looks at a whole series of projects that you've carried out in similar vein at library buildings, uh, from Oxford to uh, Czech Republic, a uh, whole range of uh, really high quality buildings. Tell, tell me how the uh, Lambeth Palace building like, fits into your, uh, your workload, as it were, but also into its, its historic context. It, it fits in because we've worked on special collections uh, since we looked at the library for the Royal College of Art and, uh, and their special collection, and then the Women's Library. And it is wonderful area of work with which to engage because the objects themselves are so interesting in all of these special collections and special collections are very personal because no matter what it is people have made decisions about what they kept over the years so there's there's a human dimension to it and they are very often related to place and to an historic context whether it, I mean, the women's library was the women's movement. So that, that was very interesting. The one in the Czech Republic belongs in the castle uh, where it, with which it will have an association in that family. And the Lambeth Palace Library is a public library, has been a public library since 1610, when Archbishop Bancroft gave it to the nation. And it may very well be the first public library in the United Kingdom, certainly one of the first. Um, but what he gave was successive archbishops collections um, at that stage, and it's gone on growing ever since. And then it's been combined with the Records Centre of the Church of England, which are lots of parish uh, collect, but you know, parish information. So drawings of churches and boundaries of sites but, but somebody told me they wanted to find out something about how you build things from Hawthorne and the only place they could find it was there uh, so lots of the information predates the British Library so it's extraordinary and it's so wide-ranging I mean I was thinking topically you know they have the information on plagues uh, but also on 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 colonization by the British Empire, all of that sort of material is in the in the library too. So it's it's always topical. And that's the library in the background behind you, is it on your virtual background? Yes, it's a virtual background of the reading room taken a few weeks ago, and they're due to complete in mid July. And then it will take quite a long time to move the collection in. So it will take at least. I mean, it, they were supposed to move in from beginning of June, and it was scheduled that they would uh, have moved in by around Christmas. So I'm not really sure with COVID because obviously they'll be slowed down moving in. They won't have lots of people all going at once, filling shelves, all this. So I don't really know how long it will take. It'll be. I think it'll be sometime next year. They'll open COVID willing. Of course, one one of the interesting things about the building it, is that it's a, it's a tower, uh, but not a tower as we generally know them. And of course, it's something which fits in very well both with the uh, older buildings uh, around uh, Lambeth Palace, uh, but also with current climate uh, issues about flooding and so on, and how you maintain a building in the in the long term. So, tell me a little bit about uh, those two aspects of it. Our idea was the site was the bottom of the garden at Lambeth Palace and the, there was a very strong feeling that they wanted to be both connected and distant uh, from the palace. Um, and we heard that it was then Archbishop Rowan who 
sounded very sad when he talked about the building because the bottom of the garden was a sort of wild area where he used to go to to sit and it was a place of solace for him and uh, but he said he was he was you know he'd be willing to do it for the better good but it made us think that we should have the minimum impact on the garden. And so we had the idea of pushing the building to the edge of the site and forming a wall so that it protects the garden and in fact only takes up a footprint of 3% of the garden. Um, but at the same time, I mean, we probably thought about going underground, but the site is of very high archaeological significance. So when we did a trial pick, they found an Anglo-Saxon hut. They looked for the others but didn't find them. So we don't know if some lone chap went off and built a hut. So they thought they would find the village. And they were very hopeful of finding the road into Londinium, which they haven't found so far. So the archaeologists, in terms of archaeology, it's not a good idea to go into the ground. Uh, there are also a lot of very mature trees and they're protected. And then it's, it's in a flood zone. So if the Thames Barrier failed, this area could flood. And whilst it's, you know, it seems unlikely that the Thames Barrier would flood, it's not a risk the librarian was prepared to take. So when we had the idea that you would elevate the building uh, and form this wall, he was quite enthusiastic. And then we felt that when you looked at the skyline and you saw Lambeth Palace comprises a number of towers built by different arch. Bishops. So we have Archbishop Lord's Tower, uh, Morton's Tower, Lollard's Tower, uh, and so on. That ours could be a constituent part of that as well. And then, if we did build up to a tower, it would mean it had a present on the skyline, which seemed appropriate for a national collection. But at the same time, from the top, you would be able to see the Palace of Lambeth and Westminster and the river. And that relationship has been key in the United Kingdom for centuries. So, and the, the base of the core of the collection is really about the relationship between church and state and the monarch. And so that seemed wholly appropriate. And it's, it's a very timeless building, as a lot of your work is, and as a practice, you you eschew uh, pass, passing fashion, really, I think. Um, and so can you sort of put your work into the context of your contemporaries and, and, and peers? Uh, well, that's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think to some extent it's to do with where we came from in that we were, we were both taught and Sandy worked uh, at Gillespie and Coria, very much by Izzy Metz day. Um, and they developed a, a relationship with brick in particular. Um, and I mean, Sandy, Sandy did a training which was part time. He worked as an apprentice in the office. And so he was taught by people with 40 or 50 years building experience. Um, and I mean, I don't know if it would have happened to anyway that in our office there's really an interest in how buildings are made. and but it's very much about understanding materials. And uh, I think when we set up, it was at the time when things were moving into design and build, and we didn't really want to do that as well. And so we chose to work in the historic environment because we thought people would be more careful. But I think we were quite clear that, um, that we could say to clients, um, what we're doing here is important and we we have always been able to assure them that we know enough about building for them not to be taking an enormous risk if we do all the drawings and see it all the way through so i think one of the things is we've managed to be in a position where the architect stays as the focus um i mean i think o'donnell and toomey are also have that sort of relationship with materials and understanding how materials come together. Because I think part of it is to do with contractual things where if you get into design and build, someone else details it. So manufacturers make those decisions. Whereas because we've always seen it through, then we're thinking about those things from the very beginning of how you're going to build it and how things will go together. Mm -hmm. So uh, do, you, do you see COVID-19 uh, very much changing the way you work as, as, as an office or is it still 
all of you going into the office uh, each day and working in a very, let's say, traditional manner? I don't know. I mean, it's so uncertain. We've just done a questionnaire with the office uh, and uh, it's very interesting to read the feedback. So most people want to come back they, and they really the think that they miss most is just informal conversation and being with other people, even those who are living with their partners and that sort of thing. Um, and, and I think, and it's also about the discussion and the debate that you have. So they are working incredibly effectively, but they miss that. So there's certainly an enthusiasm for us to find a way to get back. And then we're working hard on a, on a bike scheme for those who don't have bikes. So most people who don't have a bike would like a bike. And uh, so we're going to sort that out. And I, I know you're a cyclist. I cycled one of my daily items in the lockdown. One sunny Sunday afternoon, I cycled down to the Thames from Camden. And it was such a pleasure to go through London with no cars and families out on bikes and to feel confident, you know, that you were something was going to hit you. And it's, I, I, I just feel with COVID that there have been some really positive things like that. And if we could, if there's some way, if we could have a determination to try and take those things forward, you know, it, I, I, uh, I heard someone talking about COVID at one point and saying, you know, they were, those countries that had experienced SARS and bird flu and things were very quick to react. Whereas because we hadn't experienced it, we didn't. Whereas now, I think if someone said, you know, it's, there's a spike or there's another pandemic, we'd all close down really fast. And they said, the, the problem is if you haven't experienced something, even though you're told about it, you, you don't quite believe it. And I feel that's where we are with global warming. And if somehow COVID could mean a breakthrough in terms of how people treat the environment, you know, with sustainability and cities, so that we could move about safely and not pollute it. Um, it that would be fantastic. And I, but I, I feel we, in some ways, you and I and other people need to have that determination to try and make it happen. Ab absolutely. No, I absolutely agree with you. And uh, although I have to say, first signs aren't great. I've been <laughs> out cycling this morning and the roads are absolutely jam-packed with cars. So. I do hope you're right that actually we will come out of COVID-19 uh, emerging uh, with a better way of uh, how we deal with cities and how we deal with transport. But uh, Claire Wright, uh, thank you very much uh, for your comments and your involvement this today. And I would like to congratulate you on uh, the Lambeth Palace Library. It's, it's a, a beautiful building and I look forward to visiting it sometime in the future. Well, thank you, Peter. And I look forward to you coming. And, uh... Yes, come to our party. <laughs> Look forward to it. Okay, so bye.